As you know, today's session is about poetry and why it's not being translated as much. And uh, we have a very eminent panel here with us. Um, so I'm going to start with one very basic question that, um, that, that you know, everyone thinks of when they think about poetry. Uh, you know, as opposed to prose, in poetry, when you have an economy of words where every word matters, do you think that any translation can actually do it justice? No, please, I, I'd like all three of you to weigh in on that. And the mics are here. Show them. I think uh, that's a lovely question. Thank you, Labunita. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I think no translation ever does anything any justice. If justice is supposed to be equity, which is a perfect equality on both sides, then you are never going to, in any translation, be able to get equality on both sides. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, the One of the poems that I've translated comes to us from the 13th century. It is uh, by a woman called Muktabai. Uh, she was a great uh, a poet and a saint of the 13th century. And um, the poem is uh, called Mungi, Mungi Udali Akashi. So, Mungi Udali Akashi, Tine Gilele Suryanshi. And vin another line of the poem is vin Vinsu Patalashi Zai. Okay? Now, let's just assume one thing. Uh, if you are looking exactly at word, then Vinsu is very, very simple. It is Bichu. And Bichu is scorpion. And scorpion the scorpion burrows into un the underworld is a translation of that line. But now, stop a moment and look at scorpion. In Sanskrit aesthetics, the scorpion is a symbol of desire and lust. Hence, when you go to Khajuraho, if you look at a woman, if there is a scorpion on her thigh, carved on her thigh, it is an indication that she is in a state of lust or passion or desire. That is not a commonly held belief in English. Yes. The scorpion in English represents jealousy, represents uh, venom, represents anger, but it does not represent desire. So as soon as you say the scorpion burrows into the underworld, what you've lost is the integral meaning of Muktabai's line. What is the integral meaning of the line there? It's a simple thing. These are a series of miracles that I viewed. Mungi Udali Akashi, an ant flew into the sky. Tine Gilile Suryanshi, she swallowed the sun. An ant swallowed the sun. And Vinsu Patalashi Zai is desire, having abandoned man, has burrowed into the underworld and is now tormenting the, uh, the people of the underworld. That's a miracle. In English, this is not a miracle. A, a scorpion burrows into the underworld is very simply, by the understanding we have of scorpions, where scorpions should be. So when people ask me what is lost in translation, I say nearly everything nearly 90% of it is lost. Therefore, there will never, and with poetry, where as you quite rightly pointed out, Labunita, there is an economy of words, because the words are selected in order to ring multiple bells in your head. There are bells that are ringing constantly. If you have an Indian poem which mentions 1947, no one has to tell you what the importance of 1947 is. You know 1947. But if this poem is to be translated into Italian, someone is going to have to tell them that 1947 represents the year of our independence, or they won't get it. That's what happens with poetry. That's why the po poetry is the Everest of translation. It is the most difficult job you are ever going to achieve try. It makes translating a novel like a walk in the park. Very well put, Jerry. Thank you. Um, I want, I would like Shubhud Babu also to weigh in on that 
please tell me. No, we can go. We will have everyone talk about it. But please tell us, Shubhadev, because you have uh, had a lot of your poems translated. You also edit Bhasha Nagar, which routinely publishes translations as well as poetry, of course. So please tell me where and how you think, uh, whether you feel that trans any kind of translation can do justice to your poems, for instance. <coughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I think it's on. Namaskar. This is not the question of justice or injustice. Because you know that translation has been recognized all over the world. This human civilization cannot exist even for a day without translation. You forget poetry. Uh, Damodar Mozo is with us. He, he got India's highest award for literature, Ganpit Award. And it is all because of translation. And uh, Jerry Pinto, I have read him. He will be surprised to know. I first read him in Bangla. In, in Bangla? Yeah. Bengali is a, is, a, is a fabulous archive of translation. You don't know. Pablo Neruda was first translated in, in India. It was in Bengal. And it was as early as 1930s. And it was Shubhash Mukhopadhyay, having met Pablo Neruda, came back to Calcutta. He was living near, in, around Deshapriya Park. And he started translating Pablo Neruda. And Pablo Neruda became a Bengali household name. Tonight I can write the saddest lines. Write, for example, the night is starry and she is not with me. This world famous poem, the most of the Bengali students, the most of the Bengali boys and girls, they read first in Bengali. Now it is on syllabus everywhere, but they read in Bengali first. We all came to know, uh, for example, Gautam is sitting here. He is a Jivananda Dash scholar and he's sitting here. He knows that the Bengali readers, you know, they depend on translation so much. Not that much on English translation, but on Bengali translation. Now the question that we have, you know, in this, in this session, I think it is in, in connection with how India is translating India. Yes. So, you know, we had first French wave, we had Russian wave, wave of translation, then Latin American wave. So we have a lot of waves. It's the translations from French, from Italian, from Russian, from Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, almost from everywhere. But the question is now, the most important question for all of us now, that India, we, we claim that India is one, it cannot be one if we do not translate India. So Bengal has translated India. Bengal has translated Europe. Bengal has translated Latin America. Bengal has translated Russia. But I believe it, it started with Tagore. You just imagine as they are from, uh, uh, I mean, Bombay and uh, Goa. So you know, the Bengali students here, they know that it was Tagore in 1920s. He translated Tukaram. He translated Kobe. So Tukaram came to us as a Bengali poet. Kobe came to me as a Bengali poet. I didn't know that Kobe writes in, uh, I mean, in some other language than Bengali. So it was like that. It should be translation, should be uh, my own poem, my own translated text. The translated text should not be read as a translated text. It should come to you as a poem. Jailkhana Chitti. Jailkhana Chitti, the, the letter from jail, you know, it's a, a, a world famous poem uh, from Turkey. So Jailkhana poem, uh, I, I mean, the Jailkhana Chitti, this poem came to us as a Bengali poem, not as a translation. So I believe that it, it, there, there was a fantastic statement made by Ashok Bajpayee when he was running 
Bharat Bhavan in Bhopal, 30, 30, 35 years ago, I was a young boy. I was invited to participate in a uh, poet's meet. So there he said, and still I have this hope, there I see that uh, he said that when a Bengali poet will translate a Konkoni poet, a Konkoni poet will translate a, a, a Kannar poet, or why Kannar, why not Tamil or Malayali poet, Mal Malayali poet, or a Malayali poet translating a Bengali poet, this is how we create our India. Our India, our, through our translation. So, you know, that, what is the idea of India? We don't live in India. Do we really live in India? We don't. We live in one language. And we have, a, like a pow, we have English with us. But do you know other languages? It's not possible for us. But it is translation. Only faithful translation and beautiful translations. If it is faithful, then most of the people think that it is not beautiful. And if it is beautiful, it is not faithful. But the question is, no, this is the famous you know, Italian proverb about translation. But I believe that it is going to be very, very important for the poets and for the readers that we rediscover each other through translation. So I'm happy when I say that I read uh, Jerry's poems in Bangla translation. When I, even, even young, young people are now translating Damodar Moses' story in our little magazines. We have a long history of little magazine movement. And just one more example with this I will conclude now, and then uh, Damodarji will speak now. One, 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 one thing that uh, I would like to mention right now. So what happened to Jivananda Dash? He died unnoticed. Even his, the spelling of his name in the Statesman, at that time Statesman was uh, a fantastic uh, paper. It was misspelled. And no translation. And he was not recognized at all. Now recently, only 25 years ago, the translator and professor of Chicago University, Clinton B. Silly. So he translated his poems, and this book is called A Poet Apart. A Poet Apart, this book was awarded here. So this book, you know, it opens the doors to the world of the mystery of Jivananam Dabash. How is it possible? Because, you know, because why I am giving you this example, the case of Jivananamdo, you cannot, uh, what, what uh, J.D. Pinto said, that I, I strongly agree with him, that yes, absolutely, this is the most difficult task for a translator, to translate a good poem, to translate a poem with a lot of, I mean, layers of meanings and a lot of enigmas. It's really, as for example, Scorpion, for example, that you were discussed. It's really very difficult to translate. But he made it possible. He came to Bengal, lived there for two years. Again, he visited Bangladesh. He lived there three years. He picked up the local language. He mixed with the boys and the girls. He played with them, ate with them, slept with them. And finally, it was possible for him to make a book called A Poet Apart. Who is going to do that? Is there anybody in the audience who can sacrifice like that? So that's a great example, a poet apart. We have to be like that Clinton B. Sillet. The way he translated Jibonanandu for America and for Europe. So I, I, I thought and I believe that even when, you know, uh, Clinton B. Sillet is was here and I also met him at Chicago University, there he said that, yes, I really wanted to translate Jibonanandu Dash to tell the world, look, we have a great poet. And that was proved, and it was proved because of translation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mozo, I have a, in fact, what Shubhad Babu said. I want to turn that argument on its head. He said Bengal translated India. I want to ask you, do you feel that some languages are more equal than others? In the sense that 
should we more, have more translations from, say, Odia or Ahomia or even Konkani? And if we don't have that enough, where, what is the problem there? You write in Konkani and I want to, you to please tell us about that. I'll go back a bit. Uh, your question earlier was about translating poetry, right? Okay. Yes. I need to hold it a little closer. So, uh, I was very happy with the articulation the, with, with which uh, Jerry answered it. And let me share one experience that I have. Uh, we all know Keki Darowala. So Keki Darowala once argued that no translation should happen from regional language to English language or English to regional language. His argument was that since uh, the language culture is totally different, sometimes uh, poetry doesn't go across. It, as, as Jerry has said, yes, he, we should accept it. But there is no other way to reach out unless it is translated. Maybe it is a bad translation, but at least there is some way to uh, take uh, the poem across the audience, across the language audience. Uh, your question was about... Uh, which one? My first question no, or my no, second one? No. Yes, uh, just that, why don't we see more translations yeah, from, say, your, Odia you, or Ahomia? Yes, Lavanita, in your own question, uh, you mentioned all languages are equal, but some are more equal. Yes. So exactly. in, your, in your articulation itself, you said, uh, why not uh, Udiya, in Aswamiya, and even Konkani. Even that, that shows, you know, uh, we, all languages are not on par. And I, I, as a Konkani speaker, a Konkani writer, I agree to some extent that, yes, uh, we have lesser outreach. But doesn't mean doesn't make any language smaller. No. Oh. Yeah, so that is one thing. Uh, yes. Uh, because of, I think, uh, writers, um, you know, taking up the activity of translations. Uh, yes, some languages are, um, they have, they are rich in translated literature. For example, Marathi mm. or Kannada or uh, uh, Bangla, as he said, even Hindi to some extent. I don't know whether extensively uh, works are translated. But I'm very happy that uh, translations are happening. And uh, to some extent, I must give credit to the activities of Sahitya Academy, which promotes translations. Uh, of course, I am not quite happy with the quality of translations <laughs> and the way the books are distributed. Uh, no rev right reviews appear. And sometimes, uh, just number that matters. Mm. It should not happen. So we, less, we pay less attention to the quality. That is why probably uh, we cannot take particularly poetry across one language to the other. I'm very happy that some uh, Sant Tukaram now of Marathi, mm. he was translated by, he is translated by Dilip Chitre. And at least there is some, uh, Sant Tukaram is now available in English for English readership. Yeah, no, that's what I say. Let us uh, pay attention to the quality of translation later, but there, are, there has to be some attempts. And one translation, supposing Carmelin is translated into Bangla, that's not the last translation. No. It can happen again. Yes. If we are not happy, if readers are not happy with the quality of translation, another attempt can be made. So, but translation activity should go on. Mm. Okay. Uh, Jerry, I want to come back to what you said about translation, equating translation with uh, uh, conquering the Everest. Very good uh, uh, example. Uh, may I tell you a fable? Yes, please. A small story. Once upon a time, there was a land called Monolingua. They only spoke one language in Monolingua. I can't sit and tell a story. I have to stand. Once upon a time, there was a land called Monolingua. They had only one language in Monolingua, but they were happy with it. But one day they felt that life wasn't quite right. It wasn't as good as it could be. So they went to their oracle, who was an old woman on a hill, and they said, Ma uh, lady, tell us, what should we do? And she said, across the river, the river of meaning which flows past monolingua, is a land called multilingua. You go to multilingua, and you get some salt from them. 
that salt you use in your cooking and your life will change. So uh, the, all these old bodgers who went up the hill to meet the old lady, they came down and they said to the people, well, you know, we have a solution. We can go across and get some salt from multilingua. And so one woman put up her hand, because it would be a woman, and said, I'll go. And so she, put, uh, she got a boat and she crossed the river and she went on to the other side to multilingua. And she said, sorry, I've come because, you know, we live in uh, unilingua, monolingua across the river and we need salt from you guys. And the people of multilingua said, you can have as much salt as you want. No problem at all. But we have one, we won't even charge you anything. But we have one rule. You can't carry the salt. You have to make a boat out of the salt and you have to take your boat to cross the river. She said, but it, it will melt in the river. And they said, yes, but that is the rule. Either take your boat, make your boat of salt and take it across the river of meaning or just go home empty-handed. So she made a river, a boat out of salt. She got into the boat and she pushed off. And immediately there was the current of idiom that tried to suck bits out of the boat. And then there was the whirlpool of dialogue that tried to drown her boat. And then there was metaphor, and there was local information, and there was culture. And finally, when she got to the other side, she had one handful of salt. And they said, is this all you brought? And she said, yes, but I will go again. That's what translators do. But please, table. let me ask my question in any case. <laughs> I thought that answered all questions. No, no. Like a Zen koan. <laughs> That's true. You could have actually silenced me with that Can one. I take a Zen koan, yeah? yeah? How do you translate a Zen koan? In English, all Zen koans sound stupid. Mm. <laughs> they just sound like people being rude to each other. Your cup is full, I cannot put more in your cup. But in the original, there is the beauty of how it looks on the page. When, in, when you try to write a haiku in English and you pat yourself on the back because you got 17 syllables, what is this uh, C-H-U-T-I-I-Y-A-P-A? Sorry, what is this idiocy? What is this dick wipery? It is not about syllables. It is about the beauty of, the, of your brush strokes. It is about your placing of the poem on the page. It is the visuality. It is the landscape that you painted in the background. All that feeds into a haiku. And we say that we got 17 syllables and we arrange them in like three little lines and we sound so happy with ourselves. And the Japanese must be looking at us and saying, give it up, why don't you? Go home, yeah. Stop this nonsense. Each of my strokes I have placed with thought. Each of these strokes talks to another stroke. The beauty of these is that I have devised a language that is simultaneously pictographic and linguistic. This is what I'm bringing to a haiku. And here is your average little English-speaking boy playing with the language and putting 17 syllables into three lines. And his girlfriend loves it. He should keep it for his girlfriend. The Japanese think. We are happy with our haikus. We often have to make do with that much salt. That much salt is better than no salt. We've read Basho. That old frog that splashed into the pond. It means something. Without all that background, with everything dropping away, it means something. So if anyone in the question and answer says, how much is lost in translation, I will throw flowers at you. Each flower in translation is a bullet. But I'm a translator, so I'm making the bullets into flowers and I'm sending them across. Because please, for the love of God, and I'm using for the love of God here, because your religion came to you in translation. I do not speak Aramaic in the way Jesus spoke Aramaic. I do not read Hebrew in which the Old Testament was written. I learnt my religion in translation. You might even have studied a little Sanskrit in school. But chances are 
you got your your religion in bengali in the bhasha that your grandmother chose to speak to you in because your mom was too busy to give you religion so your grandmother gave you religion and gave it to you in the form of stories taking which is another form of translation so give over with lost in translation rejoice that someone translated yeah uh, actually so dogo i do have a question for you okay but but we'll ask everyone okay let me ask you this mr mazo uh, taking off from what uh, jerry said taking off from what jerry said we don't see as much basho nowadays as murakami for instance uh there's much more prose being translated you know in the 70s and 80s we found a lot of poetry translations some of prose has pushed past that and now we can like i said have more access to murakami than we do to basha so what is again the reason for that it's still translation but more prose than poetry now why Uh, i'm a wrong person to answer this because i myself uh, a prose writer i have never tried my hand at poetry of course i read good poems i like them but then uh, as far as prose is concerned particularly fiction is concerned i think uh, uh, first of all there are takers more takers mm. then <laughs> more publishers who accept fiction to publish rather than books of poetry but then uh, as i said i am not competent to answer this because i am not into poetry but at the same time by prose i think uh, this is the only way to reach out to others now uh, again outside the uh, language barriers murakami is uh, like because we find something new in it something or in it something different in it and that is the reason probably we like to read him in translation mm. and but i am more concerned about translations from lang indian language to indian language it right. is not happening and i think th this is uh, the time of course uh, the publishers also are taking it ser seriously and uh, translators are also but i think more uh, indian literature should go in indian uh, languages right that is not happening even if uh, the, of course uh, fiction is published at a larger scale then uh, as compared to the poetry but at the same time uh, i don't know you know i can probably answer your questions that way from my point of view since i write in konkani that is the best uh, way to reach out uh, to the readership outside konkani that's why that's why i am more for translation and translators should get due credit for it sometimes we take for granted this book is written by jerry but you should we should also give due credit to the person who takes jerry across to other languages that is uh, not happening uh, to uh, to the right extent i feel okay okay so babu i wanted to ask you um you've translated you've had your poems translated and you have done translation yourself what no, no, do you no. I, i have never translated my poems no in bhashanagar you have not okay. my poems not, your, not, not your, my poems. okay but what would you look for or what would you expect to see in a translation of your work what are the few things that you that would hit the right chord do you think uh, or the right notes so to speak i hope that many of you can remember one statement made by octavia paz in mexico city in as early as 1998 he said that the most important thing that has happened to the world literature is translation and he described the last century as a century of translations if you look at the history you find that it is because of translation translating you know uh, one continent is translating another one country is translating another one language is being translated from another this is 
how we came to know each other. This is how we came to know the poetry of the world, the literature of the world. And we cannot, you know, if you, if you look at the books, translated books on one side, and the original books on the other, you find that the translated books, it can outsize, it can outnumber the original books in the world. And so the whole world is waiting for translation, whether it is poetry or fiction, non-fiction, haiku, Murakami, whatever it is, it is all because of the translation that we are able to love, that we are able to criticize, we are able to enjoy fable. It is all because of translation. And I believe that Bengali as a language has always uh, done this justice, justice, quote unquote, as you have said, justice. I believe that it happened to us and also to other languages of the country. And at the very beginning, I pointed out that the most important thing for India is now that a Bengali writer should translate a non-Bengali writer. A Marathi writer should translate a non-Marathi writer. How? I don't know. Nobody knows, but one has to know. Because you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you think about poetry, the translation of poetry, all poetry is translation, even in original languages. If you write a poem in English, it is a translation. If you write a poem in Bengali, it is a translation. Your brain, every moment is working on translation. The things you perceive, the things you see, the things you translate and then you put into your translation process, a human being is born with the translation machine. Without this machine, you cannot love, you cannot enjoy, you cannot cry even. So I believe that translation in India, right at this moment, is the most important thing. And uh, as it says, and as you, are, you have also pointed out, that uh, is it enough now? No, not enough. I have just one proposal. I have just one idea because you know, Shahitra Academy, for example, had only one center of translation. It was during the time of you are Anantamurti, the great novelist, the great fiction writer of India. So he set up the school, I mean, the translation center, Shabdona, it was set up in Bangalore. But I believe that each and every language, in each city, there should be one translation center to translate in, from Indian languages. If we have center, if we have some sensible people with us, and if there is a regular process of trans putting people into translation, I think that way, can be, it can be an official way to do that, because Bamodarji has already pointed out that the way the Shaita Academy are doing, it's good, but it's not enough. But at the same time, I believe that even some private agencies should come up with the idea of translation centers. And again, I am saying in Bengal, we have a lot of magazines, little magazines. They are dedicated to committed to translation. They do it on their own. They don't look for any funds. It is their love's labor. So I believe that is really important for all of us to translate, to translate each other. That's the most important thing. Thank you. And by that, sir, do you mean, if you could just hold on to the mic, Shubhadabu, do you mean equal amounts of translation for both poetry as well as prose? Because our session today is primarily about poetry translations. Yes, yes, because Please you know, poetry, poetry does not sell, prose does. So, you know, there is a, there is a kind of business behind it. But you don't have such business for the translation of poetry. So when we translated Kedarnat Singh, another Ganpit Prize winner poet, when we translated Kedarnat Singh in Bengali, in Bangla, so we didn't think about the publication of the book. But it was good that a publisher came and he asked for the manuscript. So we gave him and it was published. And we'll be surprised to know that in a year it had second edition. So it goes like that. We didn't expect, but it went like that. So 
Kedarnath Singh was, uh, you know, immensely popular even in Calcutta at that time. Before that, before the publication of the book of his poems, Akal Me Sharash. So we uh, translated a lot of his poems in our little magazines because the little magazine movement in Bangla is absolutely different. It doesn't happen in other Indian languages. So little magazine movement in Bangla, I still believe translation that the translations that I have been talking about today, it is mainly because of the, the idea that we had as young uh, writers when uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, we had so many you know, friends together, sitting together, spending nights and days for translations sacrificing their own time for creative writing, their own writing, but they translated. You look at Shuhash Mukhopadda, you look at Shankho Ghosh, they all translated, Shudhindranath Dattu, they all translated. So, Buddhadev Bosch, a great translator. So, we have that great tradition. Did Buddhadev think about the publication of Charles Baudelaire? Baudelaire became a Bengali household name after the publication of that particular book. So you just imagine how it happened. It, it, it happened so many years ago. So now we are talking about the centers. I'm sorry to talk about the centers for translations. Think about Buddha de Bosch as the center. A one individual, one individual as a center. Who translated, who popularized Baudelaire, Rene Maria Rilke, and many others. And at the same time, he was translating from Indian languages. So I think translation is a culture, and translation is the protector of human civilization. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry, I want to come back to you about an experience that I'd like you to share with us. You've shared quite a bit, but I'll take that forward. Tell us about a really difficult piece of translation that you attempted, and how did you get through that? I think I wanted to talk about a lot of things that, I, that uh, were brought up already. Sure, the, sure. One of the questions that you asked was about uh, why are there some uh, languages that are more equal than others? Yes. It's a very simple answer. It's economics. Napoleon said it 250 years ago. A language that has an army is a language. Otherwise, it's a dialect. If Ahomia and Konkani are not as big as, Bang as Bangla and Marathi, it's because Ahomia does not have Kolkata and Konkani does not have Mumbai. It's as simple as that. This other belief that we must uh, all think about translators as uh, these glorious saintly figures who have given up their lives, I can't see anybody doing that in the current generation. So then, if we continue with this, translation dies, simply as that. The reason why translation is so messed up right now is very simply economics. You don't buy translation. You guys, you, I'm looking at you. When did you last buy a book in translation? It's as simple as that. When did you last buy a book of poetry? Next question. Now try the intersection set. When did you last buy a book of poetry in translation? Go on with you. You're not buying the stuff. Who's going to do it? Little magazines by their nature are incendiary objects. They burst into flame and they die down. They're meant to go after six issues. Or they, st they stultify into the Shohitya Academy's larger model and they become the establishment and they do exactly the things that they try to destroy. So if you are not buying, you are not opening your pocket, do not expect it to happen. It's quite simple. Next, how many of you, if you are under 30 or under 40, have read something in your mother language, in your home language, in the last 10 years since you left school. Two hands. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. Because you are at this festival. If I went out into the larger world, English is the killer language. 
what you are doing when you are buying a murakami is you are buying into cultural hipness you are saying i read murakami and everybody who is sipping gin and tonics will say i am by reading murakami but if you say i am reading uh, uh, if you say i am reading dilip chitre it's likely that people are going to say who what i am not of chitre and if you have not of chitre then it's out so the idea that cool is white cool is yellow cool is anything but us cool is anything except the next door neighbor cool is anything that is written in an indian language cool is now pizza cool is now tempe lebanese food and you're opening your wallet willingly to pay 200 bucks for a coffee and you won't pay 2 300 rupees for a book so your mind is starving and dying and the challenge of poetry is to a well fed mind when you go into poetry literally with the modernist imperative and with postmodernist poetry they are demanding an engagement they are not saying come i'll stroke you on the head and so say soja raja soja they are not saying come look at the tree how beautiful how sunset is nice nothing like that is happening it is a challenge to you to work with the poems but hey your mind has not been read working for a long time so you open the book you read five lines and you think what is going on and you put it down again and you go and buy the flavor of the month that you can discuss i am not sorry to sound terribly cynical but if we cannot discover how important and valuable the neighbor is we will never know the world we cannot know the world without knowing ourselves first and our immediate surroundings and therefore you you heard shubodh babu talking about this that it took an american to come here and discover jeevananda das is that not shameful in a way and of course the argument is simple the man is being paid in dollars he's got a tenured track he is going to make a lot of money on this anyway i'm not making money so we've got to actually find a way to fight this and there is no point thinking about centers and there is no point relying on individuals we can't rely on individuals we've got to make this a community thing you've got to start reciting poetry at your wedding to each other you've got to buy books of poetry get naked in bed with your girlfriend and read them to her you've got to give poetry books as wedding gifts you've got to write start writing love poems and handing them out as gifts and these must be valued if we don't do this if we don't make poetry every day we begin to lead prosaic lives <laughs> but but okay do we have time for questions okay should we open it out now all right please if you have questions uh, please do um, ask up panelists hello i'm audible yeah. uh, my question is to you shubhad babu you talked uh, about can you speak up we can't hear you very well oh sorry i'm so real sorry um you talked about how the act of writing is inherently about translation about how just you uh, to speak closer to the mic okay okay is this better okay um you talked about how the act of writing is inherently about translation like how we perceive things and then we put it down into writing but there's also the ever looming fact that there's no reality outside of language so hypothetically if speaking like if someone who is monolingual who's whole reality has been shaped by one language and one language only so they perceive reality in that language and they are writing in that language only so there's no act of translation involved when whereas like when talking about someone who's multilingual who has grown up with different languages who's grown up to accept english as the status quo language or so on so like if some if they had to write in english maybe a larger confluence of languages by which they have been shaped they would act into translation into that indian piece of in that english piece of writing but for someone who's just grown with one language i don't like necessarily think there's any act of translation involved because 
they are perceiving the world itself in that language, and there's no reality outside the language itself. So, if you could. Is, is there a question? That yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. So how how does a monolingualist translate reality into language? I I mean, as I got it, I I I, I didn't understand the question fully. Uh, he can understand. Uh, I just tell you one thing. You just go outside, outside this wall. You talk to a rickshaw puller. He is not monolingual. You go to the beggars. He is not monolingual. No human being in post-colonial system or in post-modern time or post-post-post-modern times, no human being is monolingual. I have been to Andaman very recently. Even in an island I found, even they know each other and everybody is speaking different languages. It's a terrible situation for them. It's, we, we thought it is monolingual, as the fable goes like, as he said, it's beautiful. But at the same time, it's painful to understand, when you understand it, that how the people are communicating with each other. i just give you one example. After tsunami, after tsunami happened, you know, there was one last surviving speaker of the language called Boa. It got published in the Telegraph. It, was, it became headlines. Boa ran up to the top of the hill. And after two months, she came down. And the language was saved. Very recently, she died. The language died with her. Only there is one person in India who knows her language. She is a professor of JNU. I met her. And she's also, um, you know, was referred to that news. So what happened? This is how the monolingual, as you say, that Boa, as a language, died. Both of them died. I mean, the language and the speaker, the last surviving speaker. This is a terrible, terribly cynical situation. I do not want to take this as an example. I believe that every human being in the world tries to speak a language that goes beyond his own, a language that goes beyond his perception. Every human, even an insect in the nature tries to know something more than he can know through his language. So this is a human act of behavior, human act of living rather. So translation that way, I believe it, it is to ferry the civilization from one side to another, from one continent to another. This is why we came to know India. We didn't know India and still today we do not know India because we don't want to go beyond our own linguistic boundary. But at the same time, as I said, that every human being wants to cross the boundary. And when you, when you have this desire to go beyond, then the translation begins. If there is no need of translation, we will die, not translation will die. The whole human civilization will collapse and then you will laugh. The whole human civilization will collapse. I am not saying this. Octavia Paz in that particular interview, he said that. Who wanted to know about Mexico? Who wanted to know the poetry of uh, Octavia Paz? He was here as an ambassador in India. So he went back to Mexico City. And in that particular interview, he said that when he wrote you know, about India, that India where gods, humans, and animals are eating from the same plate. How can you translate it? In Bangla, in Konkoni, or in Marathi, whatever it is. But we need translation. Thank you. Do we... Yeah. Um, lady here. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question is to Jerry, sir. I'm sorry, could you speak louder? We can't, we really can't hear. Uh, yeah. Okay, so my question is to Jerry, sir. So, do you think that a poetry or a particular piece of work loses its essence when it is translated into another language? Of course, it can reach more number of readers, but uh, how challenging it is for a translator to keep that essence intact? You okay, the first understanding I think comes from, are you an English literature student? Yes. Ha, ah, I thought so. English literature students believe that there is an essence to a poem. There isn't. You have to write that answer and you have to get your MA first class and all, I get it. Go do that work. But remember this, when I read a poem, when Bhai reads a poem, when Shubhoda reads a poem and when Labunita reads a poem, there are four poems there. Each one of us has invented a poem on our own. Now, now, the trick is, there may be a commonality between our four poems. Okay? We might all agree, might all agree, okay. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, and wrought with silver and golden light, the grey and the gold and the dark cloths, of, light and, of dark and light and the half light, I should spread those cloths beneath your feet. But I being poor have only my dreams, I will spread my dreams beneath your feet. Tread carefully, for you tread on my dreams. Yeats is writing in a mad rage to Maud Gone because she is going to trample on his dreams. She will reject him again and again, Maud Gone, six foot of her with a sh brilliant head of red hair. Okay, that's all we know about Maud Gone and that Yeats loved her madly. It's an anger poem and it's been taught as a love poem. I received it as an anger poem. Now, where is the point of thinking about an essence of a poem to take across the river of translation when everybody's got a different poem that they read? So you see, this is the, the, the only thing that you can trust about a poem is that it cannot mean anything. It has no essence. It is simply a small, small little time bomb that is going to be planted in your head. It is going to blow up. It is going to change your neural circuitry for the rest of your life, stain you, change your thinking. And if you ever try to explain it to the person next to you, they will say that's not what the poem was at all. And if you tell the poet that what, the, what you think the essence of the poem was, if the poet does not throw flowers at you, which have been translated into bullets, it's only because he's kind or she's kind or they are kind. Uh, any more questions? Thank you. Oh, then there's a gentleman. Hello, yes. Uh, we've heard a number of apparently contrary and conflicting opinions being expressed there. Uh, and, well, yeah, you can wave it as well. <laughs> no, what I'm trying to say is that could we uh, conclude that poetry is a difficult uh, act to perform, uh, sorry, I mean translation of poetry from one language to another, uh, yet it is necessary and needed and essential, uh, how, no matter how imperfect the process is or the results are. Would, be, would you three agree? Yes. Jerry, why don't you respond to me? I think we can agree and leave it on that. Huh? Uh, okay. I, thought, I thought as much. I think Hello. Uh, just to answer earlier two questions or so, just uh, uh, I, I often go to Kerala and Kerala, most of the people, I'll give you an example. My, I have my niece married to, uh, from Goa, married to a Malayalam guy and she had children. And when they, first time when they came to Goa, they wanted, they, to, they were talking in Malayalam and when they were told that we don't understand Malayalam, they were surprised. How do you live in this world without knowing Malayalam? They are monolingual. But one thing you should remember, they are voracious readers. They of course rate very high on literary standards. But then uh, most of the books they have read are in translation, not knowing that they are not Malayalam books. You will find all the renowned uh, books in the world already translated into Malayalam. 
they have read sunil da in malayalam they have read um, say uh, mahashweta devi or uh, uh, or kamleshwar or rajendra yadav in malayalam and they are not at loss they are all monolingual people but we admire the seniors among them or literates among them who translated the best of works available in the world for their sake so there should be a balance because somebody we need to translate so this balance if we um, keep i think uh, that is enough so what we need is good translations and outreach and i think it is possible uh, well i am thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk i am neither a poet nor a translator as such but but yes i have translated <laughs> i yes i have tried my hand at translation not at poetry but i am uh, immensely benefited by translations because my books which have gone in translation have brought me uh, a vast readership that is how i have benefited thank you all right uh do we have any more questions uh, to answer your question just once again i think what shubodha was saying was when he said that uh, even everyone translates it's because look at it this way your thought process is neural energy it is electricity jumping across synapses that's all it is you now have a certain amount of words that you have to take that neural energy that electrical energy in your brain and put it into words that's your first act of translation now william james henry james's brother who knows what they ate henry james and william james william james once said there will never be enough words to represent the variety and difference of just one person's emotions so you are actually now taking this this feeling that you have which is doesn't have a word and you're pushing it into a word because you have to communicate that is fundamentally an act of translation and already there is a loss there because what you thought was so beautiful and perfect and it's coming out imperfect it's coming out strange because you have a limited amount of words that's the beginning of translation where neural and electrical energy is translated into language and then it crosses as sound waves again another translation now we've gone into physics from biology to language to physics it's gone in as sound waves and the person who's listening to it translates again based on their understanding of words so even if everyone is speaking only one language there are four acts of translation in one bengali boy talking to one bengali girl fantastic great on that scientific note we'll just oh shobhadeep do you want to sorry yeah great <coughs> latin american poet can you hear uh nikanor para who died recently he came to calcutta and he read out one poem <coughs> only six words only six words just a poem it's not haiku it's a poem a complete poem possibly one of the most talked about poems in latin america so he said the poem goes like this it's it was against america he was living in america at that time in new york city the poem goes like this u s a the first line the second line where and the last line the liberty is a statue u s a where liberty is a statue every american at that time used to you know have you know almost uh, boisterous laughter at the at the billboard you know that was beeping the poem almost every 5 minutes 70 years ago so he said standing here that this poem i believe 
wherever I read, this poem does not read any, does not need any translation. If it happens like that, all the poets can re re write like that, that's fine. No translation is required. But we need translation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, gentlemen. That was really, this session turned into something else. But, yeah. Oops.